My God, she's alive. They're funky dances. <laughs> we have exactly what you're looking for. I would be honored to be called Chicken. The Natural History of the Chicken. Coming up next. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. I believe that people one day hopefully will understand as I do, all children and adults, how wonderful a little chicken can be. All chickens. That they're just not a little chicken in the barnyard to eat. No, they have a special personality. May you all have the same joy I have had knowing a chicken. My little soulmate. We have a lovely little saltwater farm right on the Atlantic Ocean. It's a wonderful place and it's quiet and we all love it. And it's in Maine, so it gets pretty cold in the winter, but the animals do well here and so do the plants and so do I. It's heaven. We have 16 chickens here and they're all very different. Late in the afternoon, I always let them out free range, which is lots of fun, and they just love that. They're just all over the place, pecking at little bugs and pecking at flowers and taking dust baths and just being very busy. They all have individual personalities. Some are very uh, quiet and rather submissive. And there are others that are gregarious, and they want to talk, and they want to ask questions, and they sort of strut around. They do things that are almost human sometimes. Hey, girls. Supposed to be in here? Shoo, 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 shoo. Come on. Shoo, shoo. Shoo, shoo. Here you go. Oh, good girl. They're my friends. Oh, you found a cricket? All right, go ahead. The chickens really are my friends. Ah, there you go. One afternoon, I let all the chickens out to uh, graze outside and cruise around. And it was very, very cold. And it had been forecast that we were going to have a nor'easter. The weather became very raw and it started to snow. So I said to Dog Martha, I said, we'd better call the girls in. Chicky! Chick, 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 chicky! Chicky! So we did call them and everybody came but this one, number seven. Chicky! Chicky! And I said, Martha, you're gonna have to find this other chicken because I don't have any idea where she is. So she did. She looked everywhere, and finally, she said, Oh, here we are. Here's the chicken. And sure enough, there she was. But the poor dear thing was lying on her back, just frozen. Like the kind that you'd find in the grocery store. So we dragged her out with one of the rakes, and we brought her in the house so that we can put her in a box and bury her when the snow lets up a little bit. I was going to put her in a shoebox, but her feet were stuck way up in the air, frozen, and so what to do? And so we put her in the kitchen on a table, and I did some uh, housework and came back in about an hour. And the legs were still pretty, pretty stiff. But I looked at her more carefully, 
and I found that she had a little throb on her neck, a little pulse. My God, she's alive! So, I got the hot water bottle and put her on her back on that. She was breathing about four times a minute. So I, I thought, well, by golly, you'd better, you'd better give her CPR that I had, that I didn't know too much about, but I'd seen it on television on these doctor shows. One, two, three, four. So I, I gave some good swift one, two, three, four, and, and, and I pried her little beak open, and I did give her mouth to beak. Two, three, four. I did this for, for quite a number of times. In three hours, she, uh, she was back in business again and stood up and was looking for dinner. I gave her a lot of hugs and I told her she's going to be okay. And um, we were going to take care of her. We brought you back. I had a baby crib, which I put up in the living room. And uh, she stayed in this baby crib for a whole week until she got her strength back and seemed to be having a good time. She enjoyed watching television very much. And of course, that's where we got all the idea of doing the CPR for her. This is how I learned how to do it. chickens because I like to know where my family's food is coming from. I want to be closer to the whole chain of life. Just as my garden, to put the seed in the ground and finally eat the vegetable, I raise the chicken and we finally eat the chicken. And so I'm part of the whole cycle of the food chain and I, it, it gives me a sense of well-being. Hello girls, how you doing? Good morning to you. 
I could have chosen many other kinds of animals to devote my, my energies to. But chickens have a kind of energy that excites me. And it, 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 it brings life to the farm. And I, I enjoy that. For most of the day, I let them run free. They're as free as I am on the farm. I think the chickens here live a great life. I can tell not only from the flavor of the meat and the quality of their eggs, but in just their, their sense of well-being. And these are very happy chickens. My dominant chicken, of course, is Moon Rooster, who rules the roost, literally. Moon Rooster seems to mainly be interested in protecting his flock. If there's a strange sound, they'll look to him and look to the sound. He's a signal bearer for danger. He keeps track of every hen all day long. He seems to be most vigorous, perhaps like some of us, in the morning. And he will start courting some of the hens, scraping and strutting around them and then leap on them, you know, and, and um, mate with them. So Moon Rooster is the one who's both father figure and also lover, I guess. The rooster's main call is he makes a, a, a crow sound, which is... Most of the time he flaps his chest before he crows. main ritual he has is the mating dance and how he gets a, a hen to come over is he lures her by making a sound when he finds a piece of grain or something. <laughs> and then the hen will come running in and she's picking up the grain or whatever and then he does a dance around her by putting one wing down and one leg up and it's <laughs> and at that point they either mate or the hen will run from him <laughs> and then if he mates with her afterwards it's It sounded like a, a train wreck. It sounded like small children being choked. They kind of sound like they're tearing their guts out. Long fingernails going on a blackboard. You find yourself walking around with your fists clenched and your body clenched. It was with us all the time. We could not get away from it. It's, it's when you're washing the dishes, it's when you're sleeping, it's when you're talking to friends, it's when you're taking a walk. And you go, oh, it's the noise in the background. It's the roosters. It started four years ago, and the webs had moved in in approximately November. And in February, they started erecting these structures. I knew what they were. They were getting ready to raise fighting cocks. And so three months later, uh, 25 roosters arrived, and, uh, and it started. The noise was just a constant din starting at about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and it would go on till about seven or eight at night and start back up again in the morning. There was never a time where it was completely silent. I can remember during a rainstorm at three o'clock in the morning, you still would hear a lone rooster crow. They just never stopped. It's something that one can't maybe clearly identify what the sound is, but it's just an extremely annoying sound overall. You know, something that basically almost hits you emotionally. It was like Chinese water torture. It was like having little drips just falling on your forehead at, at regular intervals. A rooster is not a, a, not a beautiful songbird, okay? It's, it's when it yells, it's yelling for a mate. 
It's claiming territory. It wants to be heard. What the man who was raising the roosters heard was money. He heard uh, gambling. What we heard was a sound of uh, loss of our property value, a loss of our peace of quiet. It's kind of a destruction of our home. The problem with the rooster noise was that it was foreground noise. So we set up wind chimes, we set up uh, noise machines, we rigged fountains, we did all kinds of things to shift the rooster's noise to the background. In the morning, I would immediately get annoyed. I'd just think, roosters, you know, why do I have to even think about roosters? I'm already, it's, I just got up and already I'm thinking about roosters. I don't want to think about roosters. It made me angry. It made me angry that somebody could come into our, our nice neighborhood and think that we were so stupid that they were going to get away with something that was just, um, I would just, it blew my mind. It was obnoxious at 20 roosters, or at 20 huts. When it got to be 100 roosters, it was insane. It's not something I could passively listen to. Things needed to be done. How am I going to get rid of these things? What's the plan? What are we going to do? People talked about parachuting in poison and, uh, you know, letting minks loose over there and ferrets. Other people said, uh, I'd just crawl over there with a gun and start taking them out one by one. I never really found out a whole lot about Bobby Wayne Webb. He's kind of a mysterious guy. I enjoy raising roosters very much. To me, from raising that rooster from a little baby chick till it gets full grown, see what it turns out to be, it's like raising a kid to me, you know. I just love, love fooling them. It's a lot of care, a lot of hard work, if you want to have a real pretty rooster. The only time they crow is early in the morning at daybreak. It's because they're waking up. And in the evening, when they're going to sleep, and I'm feeding them when they crow, that's when they mostly do all their crowing. I think it's a lovely sound myself. Well, that crow is a challenge to all the other roosters in hearing distance. I'm here. I intend to stay here. And they ain't nobody can do anything about it. They've got two purposes in life the way I see it. Their main purpose in life is to reproduce. And the other purpose they have in life is to kill another rooster. They just hate another rooster. That's the way they came out of the jungle in Asia. They don't get in the skirmishes just for the fun of it. Every skirmish they get into is a life or death situation. One of them's going to walk away alive, and the other one's going to walk away dead. Well, I'm quite a uh, student of Eastern philosophies, and one of the books I've read was On the Art of War by Sun Tzu, a Japanese warlord, and he wrote this doctrine on how to defeat an enemy. Sun Tzu emphasized the need to get allies, that one-on-one -on -one you could not win. You needed six to one, ten to one in order to win. So I got allies. I got the neighbors. I got the county prosecutor. I got the newspaper. You know, I just heard rumors saying I was in the mafia and all that stuff. Said I was cockfighting down here. And you know, they, they started them rumors by going around and telling all the neighbors, trying to get them to sign a complaint. When I moved here, you know, I talked to the zoning people and made sure everything was all right. And they said there'd be no problems. 
So I went to start raising the chickens. <coughs> Next thing I knew, I was being sued. First, we tried to sue them through zoning. We lost in that endeavor. And then we switched to uh, suing them as a nuisance. I hired Brian Doyle to record the numbers of crows as they occurred throughout the day. And this was evidence that we used in our court case. Uh, we estimated that there was approximately 20,000 crows in a day. I can't believe that. I think it was just, they just didn't want me here. No reasonable person should have to listen to this kind of noise. And the judge agreed. It took a long time winding through the court, but it ultimately did work. I hate to be ethnocentric, but you know you're a redneck if you're raising roosters for cockfighting. It's taking a deep breath and going, wow, this we really won. Wow, this is really great. This is how it was, you know, three years ago. I'm, we're happy. This is the country. I think they are a bunch of wine yuppies. We live in an agricultural area, that's what agricultural areas are for. I mean, if you uh, don't like the sound of a rooster crawling, why would you want to move to the country? The hen's first order of business in their day is laying eggs. Then they'll do other things for comfort. They'll find shady spots in hot times of the day. They love their dust baths. You'll, you'll see them shooting dust up into the air and fluffing their feathers. And it gets the, the, the dust right next to their skin and helps to kill a lice and other vermin next to their skin. Every day we have to gather eggs or they spoil. But in free-ranging chickens, it's a little bit more adventuresome than it is when you have them in a hen house where you know where the eggs are. The chickens are remarkable in what they produce every day. And they're beautiful, they're delicious, they look very different from what you buy at the grocery stores. I'm gonna get all of them. I found another one.
This is Cotton the Rooster. A cotton Rooster has been with me, oh, about seven years, and he's really my soulmate. And I fell in love with him, and he fell in love with me. Right, Cotton? He's such a little sweetheart. This is a very special little chickie. As you can see, this is my baby. Knowing a chicken is something very special. They're just not here on this earth to eat. They're here because they're beautiful creatures of the universe. darling. Here is a poem I wrote to my cotton rooster. Each day the beautiful white rooster called cotton arises crowing. Okay. It's very easy. You don't get he has such love and happiness. Oh, look how tiny you are. He has such a joy exuding from his whole beautiful being. I never even knew a human that was filled with so much love and joy, so great to greet me each morning. We're all done. What beautiful. Here we go. We're all finished. Off we go. Look, isn't it a beautiful day? We're going on a wonderful ride. Aren't you happy? He really thinks he's human. He doesn't notice the difference. <laughs> because he does all the things we do. You know, he wants to get up on the bed and go to sleep there and wants to eat with us. In fact, he'll jump up on the table when we're eating and he eats just about everything I eat. Corn on the cob, that's his favorite. And, uh, oh, he loves a good McDonald's. Though I don't have that too much because I'm not a junk eater. <laughs> I've watched a little bit of what the hens eat. Sometimes, of course, they'll go into the driveway and just fill up on rocks because that's how they eat. They don't have any teeth. Nutritionally, they know exactly what they need. They'll take, like, for example, one dandelion fluff, and then they'll move to another weed and take a little piece of a leaf, and also uh, little pieces of dirt or something I can't see because their eyesight is just fabulous, like living microscopes. They'll also f chase anything that moves, so they're very good at taking moths and flies and mosquitoes and everything like that. They're always after things that are moving. When I leave the house, I always leave the television on for him so he can watch television. Or I leave on classical music. Of course, he loves Pavarotti. They're so intelligent. I mean, they're just like dogs or cats. Well, I've heard of them being housebroken, too. But he has a little panty on him just in case he would have a, a little accident. The panties, how do they work? I tie them here. See, it comes. Here it is. Just tied under the wing. So they're very comfortable. And they just come right through. Then I put a little diaper pad inside. We can't always judge animals from our own kind of intelligence. Chickens have their own chicken intelligence, chicken instincts. They have a, a, a sense of affection for each other. And I know that they communicate like you and I communicate. They have a wide variety of sounds. Scolding sounds, come hither sounds, sounds of surprise and shock. If we could just see the beauty of a chicken, a chicken's personality, that they're not just in the barnyard, they're here for a reason. It is a beautiful, beautiful gift to us on this earth.
What happened when the press got a hold of it was rather, rather scary to me because I had never had any experience with anything like this before. Her fame went very fast. I got calls from people from all over the country, talk shows, DJs. Uh, we went by satellite to Guam. We went by satellite to Australia, Nepal. It also wound up in Moscow. And I think there was a lot of interest at the story at this time because there were a lot of things that were going on that were not particularly pleasant in the media. The trial of O.J. Simpson was happening. Orenthal Jane Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. And I think people were just kind of fed up and needed a story that was homey and a Cinderella story, if you will, that did work out. <laughs> After she got some good, strong feathers and was back on her feet, I thought that she deserved a little better than just number seven. So we decided to call her Valerie for her valor. <coughs> Queen Valor, maybe. I don't know. But Valerie it was. And she has responded to that name ever since. <laughs> When she went back into the coop, all those girls were astounded to see her. They all sort of crowded around, and it was like a town meeting. I mean, you know, everybody was talk, talk, talk. And, where have you been for a week? Let's hear where you've been and what you've been doing. You were gone quite a while. What, where, where were you? And tell us about it. Tell us about it. She said, well, I have had a real experience, let me tell you. And so Valerie, I guess, told them that she'd been in the house and... Things had been very nice, and she was watching television, and she had good meals and lots of love. It was just delightful. There was a friend that I had here locally, and she knew someone that was an animal communicator. And so she called him, and she asked him if he would be willing to ask Valerie a couple of questions. The first question is, when you were uh, frozen, had you been going down the tunnel with the light at the end? And if so, why did you come back? And so Valerie said to him, yes, indeed, I did go down the tunnel. I got pretty close to the end where the light was. And then I was told, you must go back. And I realized that I had been put on this farm, not just to lay eggs, but to prove to people that with love and with caring, miracles do happen. Mr. Olson was a real enjoyable man to talk to. I always made a special point to come by and see him because I was little. And I asked him how his chicken was, and he said, all good things got to come to an end. So I really never did know for sure what happened to the chicken. It was a strange episode. He was headless. Headless rooster. <laughs> that was how the story goes. Headless chicken, bull. But proof is in the pudding. I went out and seen it two or three times. He was a great rooster. Once upon a time and a half, but it's kind of hard for anybody to believe. But it's true. Yeah, it is true. Back in the 40s, when my grandparents were running the farm, they raised fryer roosters, fryer hens, and they would slaughter a few of them at a time for their own use, and then they would sell them. My grandfather would chop the heads off, and my grandmother would start picking and cleaning the feathers. Well, he would just keep chopping and throwing them down there in a the pile, and they got to the end, and one still was alive walking around. Now he told me that, you know, on occasion one would get up and they'd flop around and maybe live for a few minutes, but they'd always go ahead and die.
but they had one that didn't die. Any normal man had reached down, picked him up, and cut his damn head off again. But not only. He picked him up, stopped him from bleeding, and that was his headless chicken. And that was Mike. And after it had lived for two or three days and was getting along fine, of course, neighbors started finding out about it, coming and seeing, and people started hearing about it. You get a six pack of beer and go up there and you get to see the rooster. That's when I started thinking, boy, I'd like to have that. I've seen a two headed calf before at a fair, but not anything without a head. I mean, that's, that's impossible. A gentleman by the name of H.B. Wade had heard about it, and he was in the business of promoting different things, and he got in touch with my grandparents and convinced them there might be a little money made in it and taking it to sideshows and things like that. Mike was on exhibit in Salt Lake. Out in California was uh, shown in Phoenix. They showed him several times in Chicago. Florida, Atlanta, and New York on the East Coast. They had dreams of making money off of this rooster. Seattle, Frisco, L.A. on the West Coast. And paying the farm off and getting it out of debt and buying new farm equipment. And then I understand, now don't hold me to this, that it went overseas to England. He was a real rooster, though. He was, he was real peppy and spoiled rotten after a few months. Nothing but the best for Mike because he was worth lots of money. <laughs> Mike had, other than being taken around to the sideshows, tried to live a normal life. When they still had him on the farm, they let him loose with the rest of the chickens. He would go out and try to prune himself with his head with his neck, really, because he didn't have no head like a chicken would. He would try crowing, which would more of a gurgling sound, the way my grandfather described it. They would feed him by hand, crack corn and through his esophagus, and used an old eyedropper to give him water. So he did require some attention, but pretty much lived like a normal chicken, even though he didn't have a head. I think Lloyd and Clara thought that they were in the money, that they were going to go off and uh, seek their fortune and retire off of this rooster. Mike drew a pretty good crowd at the sideshows, be it people that were just interested or thought it was a hoax. He had a lot of publicity about him and a lot of bad publicity too. My grandparents received a lot of hate mail after that Miracle Mike was published in the Life magazine. A lot of people thought it was cruel to keep him alive, that they should have just went ahead and finished the job and put him in the cooking pot. He was a healthy chicken all, all of the time that he was around. But they still blamed Ole. You should have cut his damn head off. <laughs> but he didn't do that. He kept him. <laughs> Lloyd always thought that it could have made him, you know, a lot of money, and, and it really never did. Mike had a problem sometimes. He would start choking or strangling on its own mucus, and they kept a little eyedropper always handy to suck that out so he wouldn't strangle to death. If I remember how the story goes right, one night they had forgot this eyedropper at the sideshow and had him back at the motel room and he started gurgling and strangling and before they could find anything to keep him from strangling, he choked to death. Their dreams were kind of crushed. They made just enough 
to buy him a new farm tractor and to finish paying off a little bit of land that he still owed some money on. I really don't know what to think of why Mike lived. Was it just fate? Did this one particular rooster have just that much will to live? Or was it just because he was so a dumb of an animal that he didn't even know his head was cut off? I think it's one of those mysteries of life, of really why it happened. In order to eat a chicken, you have to kill a chicken. Now, there's just no easy way around that. I try to do it as easily on them as possible. Uh, I try to respect them all the way through the process uh, to the table. All farmers uh, take this as a matter of course. I guess I feel a bit odd about speaking about killing because I know many, many people have no experience of this at all. It's very difficult for them to see it as not being cruel, but I don't see it as being cruel. I see it as necessary. <laughs> Somebody's doing it. If you eat meat, somebody is harvesting that creature for you. Well, let's have a toast to our chicken tonight, okay? Here we go. To our beautiful chicken feeding us tonight. There's a sense of, of wholeness about growing your own food. And the chickens remind me every day that it's not just me in this world. It helps me stay attuned to those things that are important to me, like cycles of life and death, of happiness and sadness, just everything that makes a life rich. So it keeps me connected to things outside of myself. It's strange how we pick up certain expressions. From the time I was a little kid, one of the worst forms of derision was to be called chicken. The quickest way to get a fight started was to use this name against a target of ridicule. The implication was always that a chicken was a coward or lacking in courage. Many people have never really known a chicken. I mean, the feathered bird commonly found on farms. I've been fortunate to be around chickens much of my life and have formed a close bond with several. One of the more memorable was Liza. Liza was a Japanese silky bantam. She was about half the size of the average barnyard hen, but big in her love for life as well as her unfailing determination. Her feathers were snow white, fluffy, almost fur-like. A patch of feathers perched atop her head like a comical crown. Her dark eyes sparkled with life, and as I later realized, a great depth of chicken wisdom. One aspect of life, however, seemed to elude Liza, motherhood. She laid eggs regularly, tiny bantam eggs not much larger than marbles. But her diminutive size put her at a great disadvantage with the other chickens. And the larger hens always crowded her out of the nest before the required 21 day incubation period. As the new mothers would introduce their brood to the real world, Liza would attempt to take over the duties of mother. Thank you. 
As a result, she took a great deal of abuse from the other chickens. I felt a compassion for Liza, sensing how desperately she wanted to experience motherhood. I attempted to help her by making a nest away from the others. Liza readily accepted it and began laying eggs. However, I soon discovered the eggs broken and contents eaten. Liza began exhibiting signs of great distress. She erratically checked empty nests, clucked in a strange, monotonous way. Realizing that something had to be done, I constructed a miniature chicken house, complete with all the amenities, food, water, and a private nest that would be the envy of any chicken's eye. Liza settled into her new home and immediately began depositing eggs in the nest at the rate of one a day until she had six. She then went into the setting mode, plucking feathers from her breast to line the nest and expose her warm, moist skin to the eggs. Finally, the eggs began to hatch. The baby chicks were unbelievably small. It was difficult to count them, but they seemed to disappear almost immediately into the fluffy feathers beneath Liza's wings and breast. And never was a mother more devoted, more thrilled, or more suited to the task at hand. Liza was fairly glowing with the pride and joy of motherhood. I kept the little family in their confined space for a few days, reluctant to allow them out into the real world filled with so much danger. Liza pleaded with every motion of her body to take her new family out into the world. She paced back and forth at the door until I gave in and opened their lives to a world filled with green grass, the warm, moist earth, and more juicy bugs than most of us care to know about. True to my expectations, Liza was the ideal mother. She showed her little family the very best places to search for seeds and grain. From sunup to sundown, she was tireless in searching out the very best for her brood. I felt quite good about the perfection of it all, the absolute order in God's universe, the demonstration of life as it should be. It was during one of these moments of reflection that I was shocked into a broader understanding of our true relationship with God's creatures. As I stood one morning, looking out over the field beyond our kitchen window, and absently watching the scattered groups of chickens going about their routine, I saw the entire community of chickens freeze. The total population of chickens scattered across the field reacted with one mind as a blur of feathered bodies dived beneath any available cover. I knew this activity indicated the close presence of a hawk. Then something caught my eye. I saw the look of panic in Liza's dark eyes as she started to run for the overhang of the chicken house. Suddenly the same thought struck us both. I vicariously lived the agonizing moment with Liza as she broke stride and turned back to the six tiny chicks still pecking in the grass, oblivious in their infancy to the event happening around them. With one command from Liza, the babies instantly rushed beneath their outstretched wings. 
I've tried to interpret the expression I saw come over her. Was it resignation? Perhaps surrender? Or was it releasing and putting the outcome into the hands of a higher power? As I slowly and reluctantly walked toward the spot, I was impacted by the immensity of what I perceived to have happened. I had just witnessed a chicken perform a deed that would make headlines if the same act had been performed by a human. Liza had overcome the so-called survival instinct and with precision of forethought offered her life for another. The phrase entered my mind, no greater love. Here was a creature that many educated and philosophic people had declared not only to have no soul, but to be without the capability of thinking or reasoning. Yet Liza had performed the supreme, heroic, and selfless act. I stood looking down at the pile of feathers in the grass and weeds. As I touched the mound of feathers, a startling and unexpected thing happened. Apparently misjudging the depth and thickness of her coat, the hawk had missed. As I watched Liza and her chicks calmly continue with their routine of the day, I realized that I could never think of a chicken in the same way again. Not everyone will have such a dramatic decision as Liza. But at some point in our lives, we will all have an encounter with our hawk. And we will each have a choice about how we face that hawk. I believe that I was set an example, and I hope to confront any situation with the grace, dignity, and confidence in God that I witnessed in Liza. I know now that I would be honored to be called chicken. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.